The picture in the center, it reminds us of our purpose, of why we're here in this room today. It reminds us that it's indeed possible to design communities that can be resilient to disaster. Yet on the left and the right is a sobering reminder that we have much work to do. You see, the last mile problem of translating our research into policy and practice is indeed quite daunting. It could cause us to simply lose hope. So my job this morning is to remind you, with a series of vignettes, that the pathways actually exist to make this happen. And that there are individuals in this room that have made those pathways well-traveled. And now, with the investments enabled by networked infrastructure like NERI, we're able to widen those pathways so that more of us can take the journey of translating our research into practice. You see that for all the advances in modeling and simulation capabilities, ultimately, our communities are the one venue where we get to understand the interface, the complex interface, between the built, the natural, and our human environments. And this begins a vital cycle of learning from disaster. You see, it begins when a community is affected, and in those moments, we operationalize vital field data observations the collection of data that informs us and ultimately identifies the vulnerabilities that we need to address. It's that kind of work that's currently unfolding right now in the wake of Hurricane Ian. You see, these societal stress tests reveal to us the work that still needs to be done and feeds into, then, research and development, the work that many of us do in this room to address those vulnerabilities. And the results of those efforts can be a variety of things. They can be new mitigation strategies, new systems and materials and technologies, or simply revisions of our building codes and construction practices. But ultimately, those have to be effectively translated back to our communities if we're to realize the reason that we're all in this room. And that's so that they can build back better and ideally build better before the next disaster strikes. What I want to talk to you about today, though, is how networked research infrastructure, like NERI, can actually accelerate this process, which used to be a decade or more long. This idea of learning from disaster is moving really at warp speed in unprecedented ways now that we are here together under NERI. You see, now we do those field observations, but in a completely different way, because they're now well-coordinated across our hazards, and leveraging state-of-the-art technology and equipment to get that work done. And we're able now to strategically feed the data from those field observations into research and development that is supported by world-class infrastructure, our experimental facilities and our computational infrastructure that is way beyond, above what any one university could ever support is now open to us all. And by unifying this entire disaster learning loop with an effective cyber infrastructure, we're able to ensure that we all have access to the data and the models and the tools necessary to make discovery at every point of this learning cycle. But equally valuable to our ability to transform that last mile problem of translating research into policy and practice has been the idea of us all coming together in a coordinated network. You see, this community all of you in this room is what's valuable because now we have a community of researchers for the first time working across the hazards and that's made all the difference. My first vignette takes you to the site of Hurricane Michael, October 10, 2018. Hurricane Michael comes barreling toward Panama City, Florida. It ended up being a 150 mile per hour sustained wind storm reclassified by the National Hurricane Center as a Category 5. Now, this storm had catastrophic damage to Florida's panhandle. The storm surge was well documented, as well as significant wind impacts that went all the way into southeastern Georgia. And what it showed us, soberingly enough, and tragically what we're seeing again now in the wake of Ian, are the flaws in the way that we're regulating and building in our coastal areas. The flaws of the panhandle were expertly exploited and revealed that day when Hurricane Michael made landfall. So when these events happen, we have infrastructure that mobilizes, one of which is STEER, the Structural Extreme Events Reconnaissance Network. And the idea here is as a storm like Michael is moving through the Gulf, we begin to operationalize our virtual assessment structural teams. Their job, 
start compiling that flood of information that's coming in as these storms approach and ultimately make landfall. And start organizing that together, collaborating, possibly with people you've never worked with before in real time to learn from that disaster. So these Slack channels begin to light up through Design Safe, and we are bringing people in to start sharing valuable information and coordination, actually, across groups well beyond NERI. And that's what happened in this event. About a dozen volunteers ultimately came together to take that information and synthesize it into recommendations that would be used to guide what we call a preliminary virtual reconnaissance report. What should we and others do next in this hurricane example? And one of the professors who had jumped into that Slack channel and began that important work was Professor Elena Sutley of the University of Kansas. And that experience opened her eyes on what more was necessary, what needed to be done to learn from this disaster. You see, Elena noted that it's common to elevate homes in coastal areas to minimize the impact of flooding. Indeed, homes like this, as well as mobile homes, trailer parks, um, and even homes built on a crawl space foundation, they commonly would have this kind of open air, if you will, underneath the structure. But this kind of you know, treatment of a building's foundation really isn't characterized well in our codes and standards, which assume the structures are on grade. So it kind of raised an important question. What is our understanding of the aerodynamic effects that occur when we are mitigating flood? And what does that do then to our risk to wind effects? Since it wasn't considered in the way we were approaching design, uh, Elena, seeing what she had learned in the response to Michael, spun up then an NSF rapid grant, another mechanism to get her out in the field and begin collecting perishable data. She started looking at hundreds of elevated homes, and with her team studying their characteristics, the connections to their foundation, the damage to their undersides in this hurricane event. And really, the collection of the data was just the first part. It was Elena's interactions with the devastated families that made her pause and know there was a lot more work to be done in the panhandle that day. And so she started that effort of trying to work with others who were studying this important problem. How could we use the field observations to ultimately validate experimental and analytical research that was underway to understand the performance of these elevated structures? And she was fortunate to be able to leverage experimental studies that were underway at Nary's Wall of Wind facility at FIU. You see, the research that was being funded by the state of Florida's Department of Emergency Management was looking at this important question. By bringing together those field observations and those experiments, she could start to see with this team that we were looking at structures that were vulnerable, at least those that were elevated around three to seven feet. And as a result, we'd have to start considering the suction pressures that were acting on the roof system I mean, the floor system, as well as the cladding elements that covered them. And so it was time now to think about how we would advance change with this knowledge. Now, Elena was an assistant professor at the time, but she had the foresight to join ASC 7 Wind Loads Committee. And she began to learn about the codification process. With encouragement from her colleagues at FIU, she suggested that elevated buildings be brought into the 722 standard. And she began working as a balloteer just to understand the process of how you move things through these provisions. And as that process unfolded and she became educated, she then found partnership again in important ways, relationships. In this case, with respected wind engineer Tim Reinhold, who was a veteran of moving things into the standards. He helped to work with her to craft those provisions and get this research into practice. And by working together, they were able to update the provisions to ASC 722. We now can formally define procedures to look at the effects of wind on these elevated structures, calculate the pressures on their undersides, make sure the structures are ready for the next Hurricane Michael. But what I want to emphasize in this first vignette, that it was more than just the wall of wind and steer that were assets to Elena's work. It was the relationships and the mentoring from colleagues all around her that helped her move that research through the last mile of taking a storm that happened in 2018 and into provisions by 2022. But you know, elevating structures isn't the only way that we can stop the damaging effects of storm surge and waves. Another solution is to try to suppress the damaging waves in and of themselves. And so has become the journey of our second vignette. The example here, the big U. The idea after Superstorm Standy of how to protect lower Manhattan from storm surge and sea level rise. Using a combination of deployable walls, but what I want to highlight more importantly, 
vegetation, and parks. You see, nature-based solutions may indeed be the silver bullet for a lot of our challenges in coastal areas. It's something being explored by a number of municipalities across America, and now even globally through work by the EU and the World Bank. You see, the idea of using a nature-based solution is attractive, but there's still research to be done to understand whether they provide the adequate protection for these scenarios. So this vignette looks at how, again, to use field observations to move research that can validate how these nature-based solutions will indeed perform. Hurricane Irma, the Florida Keys, 2017. Tori Tomasek of the U.S. Naval Academy sees the opportunity to learn about how nature-based solutions could perform and begins conducting systematic surveys along the Florida Keys, specifically Key West and Big Pine Key. They were collecting data on over 250 residential structures and over 300 shorelines. The goal? Trying to understand the relationship between the coastal performance of the coastal protective systems and the vulnerabilities of the structures that were just behind them. And in looking at that interaction between the coastal systems and the home, she could see those correlations and important indicators of how these solutions could work. Because the sandy beaches, they were typically gone. But the mangroves, they remained. And they reduced the damage of the structures that they were sheltering. What was more beautiful about this is the mangroves, despite being hit, were already actively regrowing when Tori got there. Shows you they can be self-healing and not only just protective systems. So this inspired a line of research. We need to now understand and quantify the extent to which mangroves can attenuate the waves and reduce the wave loads. So Tori went to Neri's Hinsdale Wave Research Laboratory at Oregon State University and began important research there to recreate the natural mangroves in the wave flume. They were able to make a slice of these systems, these shorelines, using PVC pipe to recreate what nature had designed as perfect protection systems. What was beautiful about this, it wasn't just the first test at prototype scale of a mangrove system, but it was actually the idea of also developing a LIDAR imaging technique that could scan these PVC mangroves to be able to characterize their geometry. And that led to protocols for field data collection. You see, now we can use LIDAR to actually study in situ mangroves and learn from nature's brilliant design. And then we can recreate them better in the laboratories and in our computational models. Well, Tori's work tells us is that we don't have to fight nature anymore. We can design with nature through this kind of use of NERI's technologies. These field experiences, they move us. They cause us to do a change to our design practice and our building codes. So compelling sometimes that we just bypass that research and act, ask Congress to simply act. And our next vignette shows the power of reconnaissance to do exactly that. This is an inspiring story of sustained advocacy, partnership, and dedication. March 22, 2014, a hillside in Oso, Washington collapses and engulfs the community of Steelhead Haven. It was a sunny morning and a quite unexpected event to see a landslide on that kind of day. It was likely driven by a rainstorm that happened in the prior winter. It was the deadliest landslide in North American history took 43 lives, nearly 50 homes. The Geotechnical Extreme Events Reconnaissance Association, a long-standing NSF investment, is charged with deploying researchers and practitioners to study events like this. And the team for the Oso landslide included University of Washington professor Joe Wartman, who is now the PI of the Nary Rapid facility. You see, Joe is a veteran of doing this kind of field work, studying these types of landslides and other geotechnical events, but he'd rarely done them in his own backyard. Here you can see the bare earth LIDAR produced by GEAR, showing large volume landslides that put these communities at significant risk. Yet there was still continued development of Steelhead Haven, begging the question of how do we support these communities to build, and actually where? In fact, it was Joe's interaction with these affected community members that really had him grappling with the idea of what is our responsibility to help these communities resettle and to guide them more safely to do so. So Joe got energized, and he started translating Gear's findings over into resilience-enhancing policy. He briefed lawmakers, and he told them of their findings. 
But the problem is that often falls off their policy agenda very quickly. So we wrote a series of op-eds to keep landslide risk in the conversation and in the public discourse. And it worked. Because Washington Representative Susan Del Bene took notice. She asked Joe and his colleagues to provide feedback on a new National Landslide Identification and Loss Reduction Act. But it took more work, a lot of work, and partnership with organizations like ASCE to continue to push and fight for this to become legislation. By 2016, there was then a na National Landslide Loss Reduction Plan, which included a national program to identify and reduce losses from landslides and to produce 3D elevations of our country. But it took till 2019 to finally get unanimous passage of the National Landslide Preparedness Act in the House of Representatives, and not till 2021 did it get through the Senate to become law. It took, it took almost seven years after the event. That's a lot of dedication to make change, but well worth the fight. And it's already having impacts not only for landslide risk, but other hazards. You see, it put momentum behind the 3D elevation program, or 3DEP. Now we have high quality imaging of our natural and built environment. And that enables us to look not only at landslides, but things like wildfires. And with this kind of high resolution imagery, we can create inventories to look at regional simulation of the effects of things like earthquakes and hurricanes. Greg Deerline will actually talk more about this kind of work with the Sim Center after lunch. So those impacts, they cascade when we stand up and fight. But you know, if we're gonna make change in this world and actually realize our sustainability and resilience goals as a nation, it's not gonna be just understanding the demands and risks of the hazards from the load perspective. We're gonna to have to advance new materials and technologies that are capable for hazard resistance and leaving a smaller environmental footprint. And that will require a paradigm shift. Our next vignette is actually showing how research enabled by NERI and its predecessor, NICE, was able to create that kind of sustained commitment to drive change in our new materials and systems for hazards. Our next speaker actually will be John Vandalint. He's gonna tell you a lot more about the work that he did, but the key here is remembering the sustained effort it took to advance aseismic design and retrofit of wood structures from fundamental proof of concept through prototype and ultimately full-scale testing. Like Joe, John did reconnaissance in his own backyard of Tuscaloosa in tornadoes to understand the impacts to wood structures. And he used that to inspire a line of research that began under Nice at the UCSD facility in 2013 with the first test of cross-laminated timber in the United States. In a small world, Elena Sutley worked on that research showing how Nice has come full circle, creating the next generation of researchers under NARI. And with sustained investment from other agencies, that work continued in 2017 to do the full-scale testing necessary to move this into AAC 722 for use in seismic zones. Now wood is growing in acceptance for mid to low rise to high rise construction as a material that is resilient, thanks to the evidence that John proposed and generated, and also good for our planet. So what's not to love there? You know, we travel the world in this community to study hazards and the lessons and risks of failures all around the world. And it may seem really grim and hopeless to the casual observer, but these vignettes this morning should hopefully bring you purpose and inspiration. They show you how access to world-class facilities can indeed accelerate our learning from disaster. And it shows you how colleagues who've been on the front lines of disaster, like many of us, have been touched not only in our research, but a fire ignited that keeps us moving into what can be decades of research, advocacy, balloting, and testimony. And what's great is that these vignettes are not the only ones. We're not alone. We're supported by the entire community in this room, much more valuable than the physical infrastructure, working across universities and disciplines. So when you look at this map, whether we're in Indonesia again after another damaging tsunami, walking the streets of Haiti after another catastrophic earthquake, measuring high water in the Gulf Coast yet again, or looking at the debris from a Midwestern tornado, I know that this network has the power and the partnerships to make change. And I know that none of us will rest in this room until every community on this planet has the evidence-based guidance needed to not only build back better, but to build better before. Thank you.